A very good morning to everyone who have logged in. Today is a special day here as we are all talking about universe. Don't mistake it with the multiverse of Marvel series. We are talking about our very own universe. I hope all of you are equally excited. And without any delay, let's welcome our today's session speakers, Dr. Sri Devi Jare and Dr. G C Anupama. A, a very warm welcome to both of you, madam. Thank you for agreeing to do this. It's been really an honor to have you here in our first webinar series of one of a kind. I have Dr. Sri Devi Jare, who is also an outstanding scientist of the CSIR Fourth Paradigm Institute, has obtained her PhD and Masters in Engineering from the Indian Institute of Science. For the past three decades, she has been in CSIR pursuing R&D and management roles. She is a recipient of National Mineral Geoscience Award for her contribution in the field of disaster management. While also, she has received Sir C. V. Raman Young Scientist Award for exceptional contribution to earth science. She pioneered GNSS-based multidisciplinary research and has handled several multi-institutional network projects and served on several national and international committees. She has several high-impact publication and global citations for her research, and she also leads mega translational research project, advanced research in engineering and earth sciences, covering diverse scientific fields using data-intensive modeling and crowdsourcing approach. Welcome, Sri Devi, ma'am. Kindly introduce our guest speaker to the audience today. The floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you, Babitra. You can hear me? Yes, ma'am, I can. Good morning to all the viewers of this webinar series. As you can recollect that uh, on the day one I gave when I spoke about paradigms of science, I gave all examples of astronomy. So, <laughs> and today we have a very uh, well-known uh, person from this field. Dr. G I have her resume here. She is Dr. G C Anupama, President of Astronomical Society of India. It's a very proud moment for me for two reasons. On occasion of two reasons, one is that that she agreed to give this seminar, and the second one is that I am here introducing her because she has uh, achieved so much in her career. Like offline, I was telling her like my achievements are nowhere compared to hers. So it's a real pleasure to introduce. She has been in this field for almost like uh, 30, 35 years, and she has got Karnataka's Young Scientist Award in 2001, and she is fellow of National Academy of Sciences, Bangalore. Currently, uh, she is the president of Astronomical Society of India, and she served in several committees. And her research interests are observational astronomy, time domain astronomy, supernova, gamma rays burst sources, and EM counterparts of gravitational wave sources. If the uh, viewers remember in my talk, I had showed you that gamma ray telescope of Hanley and also the infrared optical telescope of Hanley. She was involved in all these programs uh, from the beginning of. Uh, her career from the beginning of the program because I think the infrared ray was in 2001 and the gamma ray is the last three years. In between they had other gamma ray telescopes also but the major one which I showed a picture was the ma major gamma ray telescope and she has several publications and over 6000 plus citations and her contributions uh, were for Vaina Bapu Observatory then Indian, Indian Astronomical Observatory and then uh, TMT project and like I showed, uh, said just now, Optical IR Telescope. She is also served as a Dean when she was in Indian uh, Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore. I have known her personally for almost like 10 years now and I have been working with Indian Institute of Astrophysics for almost three decades, I think, or <laughs> two and a half decades, it looks like, yeah from 1998, so around two and a half decades uh, with the uh, Indian Institute of Astrophysics Bangalore Center. So uh, she was a dean and she also guided many PhD students, masters and summer projects. So with this introduction, I hand over the, I hope all of you will enjoy the title of a topic. I wanted to say that 
the title of her topic and her uh, speech garnered a lot of social media attention when I tweeted on the social media. So that's a very proud thing for us. So out of all the uh, webinar series we are conducting, this one garnered the maximum attention. Yeah. And I do hope <laughs> that all of you will enjoy it thoroughly and also learn from it. Over to you, Anupama. Thank you, Sri Devi, for that uh, introduction. Now you're making me feel nervous by your statement regarding the you know, attention I've received on social media. And I hope I can live up to people's expectations with my talk. So, uh, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this uh, webinar series. Um, without much ado, let me uh, start on my presentation. I'll just share the screen. Okay. Do you see my presentation? Yes, ma'am. We can see it. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's in uh, slideshow mode, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ah, whatever. Are you seeing? Yeah. Now it is back, ma'am. Ah, okay. Fine. Okay. Anyway, yeah. So, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I will try to give you a glimpse of the universe and uh, you know the wonders that um, we astronomers try to understand about the universe using the various kinds of objects that we can see using various types of telescopes and of course uh, you know a lot of theory and uh, simulations which go in understanding whatever we observe. So let me begin with uh, the birth of the universe itself. It is generally believed um, that the, the theory proposed by Georges Lemaitre in 1957, that the universe began with a big bang. And today it is a prevailing scientific theory about the start and the evolution of the universe. It is believed that the entire universe started as a single point roughly 14 billion years ago. And it was, it is, uh, you know, as per this theory, it is supposed to have originated from a primordial hot and dense gas. This gas cooled as it expanded, and today it continues to expand. So as this primordial gas cooled, it started forming structures, and these structures have finally led to the universe as we know today. So here is just a very a very pictorial, colorful chronology of the universe. According to the Big Bang theory, we believe that the universe has five states. One is the very early universe. And you know this is the time when the inflation began or the expansion uh, began. And you know it started uh, as it expanded, it started cooling. In the very early universe, you had these very uh, the fundamental particles uh, formed. The, uh, the uh, universe was a sea of uh, electrons and quarks and other fundamental particles. And as it began uh, cooling, you know you have the large scale structures uh, emerging, and from these large scale structures, you have the galaxies and the stars. And of course, today we are in that stage. We, we have several galaxies. The galaxies having a lot of stars in them, planets, you know, everything in them. That's a present day. And what will happen in the future? How it will evolve? We don't know. But we believe that you know, as it expands, the distance between the objects will get larger and larger. Okay. And you might just have these island uh, universes in the future. But that is not known. So, here are some pictures again, you know, showing this in different ways. So, in this, you see that, you know, in the very early universe, you had these fluctuations which gave rise to these large uh, structures. There was this what is called as a dark ages when you had the formation of the early uh, stars, and then 
This does ionize the gas, so you have the epoch of deionization happening, and then you have the various formation of the galaxies and planets and stars, and what we are today with the universe expanding and accelerating. So what do we mean by the large scale structure? Now this is a picture of the cosmic microwave background. What is this cosmic microwave background? It's, it's a relic of the Big Bang. So it's a uniform uh, background material, which is emitting, which is, which is a very cool background. It is emitting at very low temperature, and it is prevailing throughout the universe. Okay? So you have this, and this is a background which is you know, see, uh, coming from the very early times of the universe. So it is at a very large distance and it has got a lot of structures in it and this is this kind of a background where you had this uniform background which had some fluctuations and perturbations which led to the formation of these kind of structures. Of course what is shown here is a theoretical simulation of these structures but we actually, when we study, when we do a survey of large parts of the sky and detect a lot of galaxies and external galaxies and put them all together, one actually observe these kind of large scale structures. Now, each of this dot here would be a galaxy or a group of galaxies. Like here, you have clusters of galaxies, for instance, right? So this is at the at the very large scales of the universe. This is how it looks. And if you go at even larger and further back in time, it appears very smooth, more or less smooth like this. So having talked about the large scale structures and the clusters of galaxies, as we saw here, for example, these are clusters and superclusters of galaxies. How does it look? If we were to image an area of the sky. So this is a, a very deep image. Now what we mean by deep image is extremely long exposures. So you keep observing the same region of the sky again and again and again, so that you can get, go deeper and deeper. Okay. So this is an image of the uh, of a cluster with the Hubble Space Telescope, which you all know has been up there in space you know, since the early 1990s, it's more than 30 years, it is still functioning extremely well. So what you see in this image here is that every single dot that you see here is actually a galaxy. These are not stars. Every single dot here is a galaxy. And these galaxies are located really far away. So this is an image of the you know, a very distant galaxy cluster. Whereas here is an image, again, obtained with the Hubble Space Telescope. Now here is an image of a nearby galaxy cluster. You can see that there are so many galaxies over here. Here again, every single dot here is actually a galaxy. So there are so many galaxies in a, in a given cluster. So once again, another uh, nearby cluster, plus a more distant you know, uh, cluster in the background. So here you see nearby uh, galaxies, which you see them as big. And then you see the smaller galaxies here, here. OK, so these are just more distant. Now, how do we actually measure the distances to these galaxies? By estimating what is called as a redshift. Now, what is a redshift? A redshift is a phenomenon by which when you're getting the spectrum from an object, there is an effect called the Doppler effect. Now, what happens as a result of this Doppler effect is that if an object is moving towards us, for example, <clears throat> then the, the, the wavelength of the light which we are receiving is shifted to the blue. And if it is moving away from us, the wavelength is shifted to the red. That is why it is called redshift. 
So you also have Doppler, uh, here I'm talking about the Doppler effect in light. But you also have the Doppler effect in sound. So that is, it is exactly this effect which explains the fact that, let us say you're standing in one place and there is a truck which is coming towards you. Now this, you know, the driver is continuously honking and is coming. You would, you know, this, you would also have heard this in an ambulance which, you know, is moving on the road and you're on the, also on the road. When the ambulance is far away, the sound coming from the siren is um, weakened. It's not that loud. But as it moves closer to you, it becomes louder. Right? And again, as it moves away from you, it becomes again, uh, you know, the, the sound lessens. So exactly the way it happens in the sound, it happens in the light. When an object is moving towards us, the wavelength that we receive from that, it moves to the blue region. And when an object is moving away from us, it moves to the green region. So here is the cartoon where I'm showing these lines. These are, this is a spectrum of the sun. And if you had the same spectrum coming from, let us say, this galaxy, then you would find these lines are shifted by a certain amount to the redward region, you will see blue to red, to the redward region. And the amount by which it is shifted, that tells us, that gives us a measure of the redshift or the velocity with which it is moving away from us. So this is how we estimate the distances to galaxies which are far away. And this is how we also know that the galaxy and the universe itself is also expanding. So coming to individual galaxies, there are a variety of galaxies. They come in different shapes and in, in different uh, sizes. But to study them, to understand them, we broadly classify these galaxies as ellipticals, you know, such as these, or, or spirals, where you have the beautiful spiral arms, or irregulars, where you don't see any very specific shape. So what is this telling us? I mean, what are we doing by classifying in these manners? Okay, it's not just these are nice pretty pictures and we are classifying them. This classification is also telling us something about these galaxies. The, the shape they have and the sizes and the shapes that they have are indicating something to us about the galaxies. For example, if you look at the elliptical galaxies, what it is telling us is that, see, these are galaxies which have, consist of stars which are older. In, uh, they were born much earlier and they are older. Okay. So the question is that, are these ellipticals formed by the merger of other galaxies? We don't know. Probably two, but we are still not sure. And that is why it makes it very interesting to keep studying them, keep studying more and more of these type of galaxies. What about the spiral galaxies? The spiral galaxies we see consist of stars which are younger, predominantly younger than the ones we find in the ellipticals. So does this mean that the spiral galaxies are younger than the ellipticals? Maybe, maybe not. But the spiral galaxies are the ones where there is a lot of ongoing star formation, particularly in the spiral ones. Like if you see these spiral galaxies, you see all the various dots over here. These are all regions where stars are. So in the spirals, we have an enhanced star formation activity compared to the elliptical galaxies. Now what about the central regions of the galaxies? So this is here is a spiral galaxy, very much similar to our own galaxy. Our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is a spiral galaxy, and these and it is somewhat very similar to these uh, galaxies. For instance, the central regions of galaxies, spirals as well as ellipticals, contain massive black holes. Now, depending upon the mass of this black hole and the accretion of the matter 
by the black hole leads to nuclear activity. And when there is a lot of activity in the uh, central region of the galaxy, it is called as an active galactic nuclei. Is there a black hole in our own galaxy? Yes, there is a supermassive black hole in our own galaxy. And how do we know this? We know this by studying the motion of the stars in our galaxy close to the center. We can see this um, animation on the right, where we are looking at the motion of the stars very close to the center. And what is found is that as the stars move, you know, in the uh, as they orbit around the center, you will find. Let me just wait for that animation to come. Yeah, here we are zooming in on the center and taking one particular star which is moving. This one here, you see that as it is coming to this part, it moves faster. Okay, and the, this this change in the speed is gives us an estimate of what is the mass of the object which is causing this change in the speed. And this study has told us that there is a supermassive black hole in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. And this study was a result of a, you know, more than a decade of work. And it is precisely for this study, for you know, understanding the, the showing the presence of the supermassive black hole in our own galaxy that uh, the you know, Nobel Prize in Physics was um, awarded to uh, two people who shared this. And uh, you know, that was, this was in the year uh, 2020. Now, that was about our own galaxy. What about the supermassive uh, black holes in other galaxies. So recently, there was a report of having actually imaged the center of another galaxy, M87. And this, uh, this is probably the first time that the what could be a black hole has been uh, imaged. It's not actually the black hole, but it is, it is the region just around the black hole. So what we are seeing here is the image from what is called as the Event Horizon Telescope. Now, what is an Event Horizon Telescope? This is nothing but a combination of several radio telescopes. It's a global network of several radio telescopes spread across the world at different locations. So there is a large baseline of radio telescopes which is created because of this. And because of the large baseline, we can see very close to the center of the galaxy. And this is what the center of M87 looks like. This is the region just ab about around the, the central black hole. Now what this picture here, the cartoon here is showing, is the different lens scales that one can obtain from different types of uh, radio telescopes. If you have a single or a closely spaced you know, array, then you see the larger scales. As you have more distantly spaced arrays, that is you're increasing the baseline, you begin to see at a better resolution. And here is what the uh, Event Horizon Telescope tells us. It is probing a region as small as just about 2.3 light days. So this was all about the galaxy on, as a whole. We, I have told you that the center of a galaxy consists of a black hole, but what about the rest of the galaxy? We know that the rest of any other galaxy will consist of a lot of stars and material in between the stars that we call as interstellar material. So how are these stars in a galaxy formed? These stars are actually born out of dense clouds of dust and gas what we call as the interstellar medium. Now this material is rich in hydrogen. And because this material is cool, 
uh, generally this hydrogen is for, uh, and, you know it's in the form of uh, molecules and hence these regions are termed as the molecular clouds it is these regions of dense molecular clouds which trigger the formation of stars now here are some pictures of molecular clouds this is the, the famous orion nebula and this is what is called as the pillars of creation there are a lot of young stars being formed um, in this some of them are hidden by all this dust in front of us but you see this glow around it this glow is coming from the stars which are being formed behind it so if we were to study the stars and the evolution of stars like a human being stars are also born they evolve they live their lifetime and finally they have an end now how a star evolves depends upon the initial mass that is the mass with which it was born so the more uh, you know the, the the lesser the initial mass the longer is its life and the more massive is the star it evolves faster okay. so we know that the most uh, you know common element in the universe is hydrogen it's predominantly hydrogen so the stars when it is formed is predominantly consisting of hydrogen and we also know that the, the energy of the star is because of the nuclear reactions which are happening in the core so initially the star burns the hydrogen through nuclear fusion to form helium and the star is spending most of its lifetime burning hydrogen to form helium and this time that the star is spending to you know burning hydrogen to form helium is called as the main sequence time why do we call it a main sequence if you were to plot the, um, the 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 luminosity or the light or the energy received from these various stars as a function of the, the outer temperature or the photospheric temperature as we call it then we will have such a plot so these are the stars here which are hotter brighter and more massive as compared to the stars here these stars are less massive they are cooler and they are fainter so this sequence of stars here is what is called as a main sequence so our sun itself is somewhere here so how do we know how do we try to understand about the evolution of the stars when the a star is born and you know it lives its lifetime it this happens over millions of years so obviously we cannot understand the lifetime of a star or the evolution of a star by studying a single star you know you cannot follow the evolution of a single star because we don't live for millions of years so how do we do that so the evolution of a star is basically understood by studying several stars thousands of stars at different evolutionary stages right from the birth sites that's the molecular clouds to studying them when they are very young these are called the young stellar objects studying stars which are in the main sequence when they are burning hydrogen to form helium studying them after they have burned hydrogen they have evolved of the main sequence we call them the evolved stars as they are evolving at, you know they at different phases of their evolution different types of stars and finally by studying the death of stars so either you can study these individual stars in you know different phases another way of also studying this is by studying stellar clusters what is stellar cluster these are groups of stars which are bound together gravitationally bound together 
Now, in this kind of groups of stars, you find a population of stars. So you will have a variety of stars of different ages. And this can also you know, help us understand about the different evolutionary phases of the star. Here are some examples of a type of clusters called the globular clusters, which are very dense and very tightly gravitationally bound. And why are they called globular clusters? Because as you can see from these images, they all appear like a, like a globule, a globe kind of you know, round. Now, as you can see here, for example, in the center, this is extremely dense. There are thousands of stars contained in the center. Now, these two images here are the images of a globular cluster obtained from our own facilities. This is an image in the ultraviolet obtained with India's first space mission, the AstroSat. And this is an image obtained in the near infrared with the 3.6 meter telescope at uh, Davison, which is currently the largest telescope we have in India. And these two images, the, this is from um, a telescope located in Hawaii called the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. And this is an image of a globular cluster from the Hubble Space Telescope. Now there are other types of clusters, which are called as the open clusters. But here also you have the stars gravitationally bound, but they're not as tightly bound as in the globular clusters. There are, these are more dispersed and relatively sparse. What is interesting is that the globular clusters contain stars which are relatively older population, more evolved, whereas open clusters have a younger population. And you know, so we have these different types of populations that we are studying that is stars at different evolutionary phases that we are studying when we still study these clusters. Now, let me look at the individual stars when we want to study individual stars, not as a part of a cluster, but we're studying stars, individual stars at different evolutionary phases. So once again, this is the birth site of stars. And <clears throat> the next stage is the main sequence. As I said earlier, the main sequence star is one that is burning hydrogen in the core and forming helium. And this is a period that the star spends most of its lifetime. The sun is a main sequence star. So it is burning hydrogen in its core. It is having a lot of activity. As you can see there are in this image, there are sunspots seen. These are all due to magnetic field in the, uh, in the sun. And here you have the sun, the chromosphere of the sun, and you have, this is the, the corona. The magnetic field activity throws out uh, you know, mass, and these are called as the coronal mass um, emissions of the CMEs. And it is these coronal mass uh, you know, uh, emissions and the ejection of mass in, during the CMEs, which, are, which also affect our own atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere. It affects the ionosphere. You would have probably read that, you know, recently um, several of the the, the satellites uh, from the uh, Starlink uh, cluster got damaged. Out of the 49 that were launched, nearly 40 of them got damaged. And that happened because of, you know, one of these ejections which happened recently. So it can cause a lot of um, it can influence the the ionospheric activity in our own um, atmosphere. It can give rise to a lot of radio noise and you know, several other uh, um, effects in our own atmosphere. <clears throat> so the sun is currently in the main sequence. Now, what will happen to the sun as it evolves? So it is sitting here today. And once all the hydrogen in the core is burned and you know, it is exhausted and we have helium, it moves into the helium burning phase. That is, helium starts burning, giving rise to the heavier elements, carbon and oxygen. So at that stage, it moves off this main sequence. 
it starts evolving and it goes into a phase called the red giant branch. So when this goes into the red giant branch, what happens is the size of the sun will increase, it will expand, and because it has expanded, it will become cooler, and because it is cooler, it will start emitting in the red region, and that's the reason why it is called red. It is red, and it is a giant because it is larger than what it is today. Now here in this cartoon, I'm just showing, for example, we have the sun today, the size. Now when it becomes a, a red giant, it will become something like this. Now what are these two stars here, Betelgeuse and Antares? These are super giants. So these are what happens to a massive star, that is a star sitting over here, that also moves off the main sequence after it burns hydrogen. And because initially itself it is more massive and larger, it becomes even larger. So compared to the sun, you can see how much larger these stars are. Uh, compared to a red giant, you can see how much larger it is. So these are the stars which are termed as super giants. Now what happens to the star in the red giant phase? Because it is large, the central core, the gravitational, you know, is not able to gravitationally bind the outer regions. So the outer regions slowly tend to move on. So this is what we call as the mass loss. The outer regions are lost from the, the core of the star. So when this happens, you can have this matter, you know, from the outer regions moving away. There are several mechanisms for this mass loss. And then you have a nebulosity which is formed around the star. Now you can have mass loss occurring in different phases. That is, it doesn't happen all at a single time. It happens in phases. And when it happens in phases, it starts giving these you know, beautiful shapes to this nebula. And if, it, if the star happens to be in a binary system, that is, there are two stars uh, orbiting around each other, then you have all kinds of complex structures as you're seeing in these nebulae. So these objects are called as the planetary nebulae, these, these nebulosity that you see here. And why are they called planetary nebulae? Because in the very early years, it was thought that it is you know, in these nebula that planets are formed, but today we know that is not true. Today we know that the planets are formed more or less at the same time that a star is formed. So a star and its planets are formed more or less at the same time. But still the historical name of a planetary nebula remains true. So when, you know, after the red giant phase, what you have is you have a central core that is a very dense core of the star or with a nebula around it and it is this dense core which is normally for a star like that of our sun it is consisting of carbon and oxygen and this is the core that we call as a white dwarf. So initially this white dwarf is very hot but eventually it cools off because there is not much nuclear uh, burning uh, happening in this phase and it cools and as it cools it you know its luminosity diminishes and eventually it can it will kind of fade out so this is what is going to happen to our sun so it will form it will be in the main sequence phase it will burn the hydrogen go to a red giant phase this is all going to take you billions of years I and mean, a million of it's like more than a million year time scale it will become a red giant, and finally it will become a white dwarf and so on. But what happens to a star which is more massive than the sun? Let us say 10 times more massive than the sun. So it will also be on the main sequence, as I said earlier, burning hydrogen. And it will go through a red supergiant phase. The sun went through a giant phase, this will go through a supergiant phase. And at that phase, 
what will happen is something very different. What happens to the sun? The core remains, the outer material is uh, lost, and the core becomes a white bar, and it fades away. Whereas here, the red giant has a very explosive death, and these explosions are called as supernova explosions. And the remnant that the supernova explosion leaves behind, which is the very dense core, is either a neutron star or a black hole. So let me just talk a little bit more about supernovae because this is my area of research, the stars that I'm interested in. So a supernova is the end stage in the life of the star. It is due to the explosions of the most massive stars. Or it can also be caused by a viper which accretes material and increases its mass beyond a certain limit, which is called the Chandrasekhar limit, which is typically 1.4 times that of the sun. So when that happens, it can also explode. And that explosion, again, is called a supernova. So observationally, it is seen as a sudden appearance of a bright star where there was no star, or in some cases, a very faint star was seen. So here is an example of a supernova which uh, had an explosion, which supernova which was detected in the year 1987 in our nearest neighbor, the Large Magellanic Cloud. This was the star which exploded into the supernova, and as you can see, how bright it became. It becomes hundreds of times brighter than what it was prior to being a supernova. So what happens in the case of massive stars? These have enough material to fuse all the way to iron, from hydrogen to iron. And we know that iron is the most stable element. So once iron is formed, there can be no further fusion. But there is material around which you keep on. There's hydrogen burning happening in all these outer layers. So there is more and more iron which is getting deposited in the core. So at some point of time, the, the mass of this iron core becomes so heavy that it can you know, no longer be properly balanced and it will collapse under its own weight, so to say, leading to an implosion. And this implosion that happens will throw out a lot of shock waves, generate a lot of shock waves, which imparts energy to the rest of the region. and all this outer material is blown off. And this is what creates the supernova. Now, in the case of the supernovae which arise out of a, out of a white bar, as I said, you have a white bar which can accrete matter by being in a binary system and its companion, and increase its mass and explode as a supernova. Or there can be two binary stars which are orbiting around each other, and as they are orbiting around each other, they lose their angular momentum and come closer and closer. As they come closer and closer, they coalesce or merge, and when that happens, it leads to an explosion. So, let me just, you know, this is a short movie which is um, showing how supernovae, different types of supernovae can uh, evolve. One is when there is a white bar and another star which are orbiting. You have this increase, the star increasing its mass, the white bar becoming a supernova. Or you have two uh, white bars which um, come closer, they will collide and they will produce a supernova. Now, a white dwarf type of supernova will leave no stellar remnant or no dense uh, remnant behind. Or you have a supergiant star which uses up all its fuel and becomes a, a supernova. So just to give a, a recap of the stellar revolution, just trying 
you have these low mass stars, I'm particularly talking in the terms of supernovae. You have the white bar forming here all the way, and then if the white bar is in a binary, it can accrete matter and lead to a type 1 supernova or a thermonuclear supernova. Or you have a high mass star which form, goes into the supergiant phase and then collapses and gives rise to the supernova explosion. The remnant is a neutron star or a black hole. These are the various kind of remnants that you can have left behind. You have left behind from a core collapse of a supernova. Okay. So why are they interesting? Because when they brighten, as I told you, they brighten up more than 100 times, which means that they can be observed even if they are very in very far away galaxies. So they occur at very large distances. They can be observed at very large distances. And hence, they also behave like extremely good cosmological groups. And in fact, it was a study of supernovae at very high redshifts, at redshifts, you know, closer to the redshift two, which told us about the fact that the universe, the universe is expanding, confirmed that the universe is expanding. And also, there is a slight deceleration at that high redshift due to the presence of some material which is causing an inverse pressure, which we term as a dark energy. And in fact, it was, in fact, this study also had received the Nobel Prize in, in Physics in the year 2001. Well, supernovae are also interesting because, as I told you, they form neutron stars and black holes. And when these neutron stars and black holes merge, they give rise to gravitational waves and also the gamma ray events. As you can see in this uh, very short movie, this is a gamma ray event which forms a jet. And when this jet is beamed towards us, they appear extremely bright. And when these kind of mergers happen, when the neutron star merge, uh, merger happens, it makes some of the heaviest element that we see in the cosmos. And in, indeed, elements like gold, platinum are all made when you have these neutron stars uh, merging together. So this is a cartoon of the periodic table. But what is interesting in this is that all these color codes here are showing how the various elements that we find in the universe are produced. So what we what we are composed of, what is present on Earth, everything is a result of a stellar material. So we are all stars. We are all one of the stars. So what, how does this happen when you have the supernova explosion happening? All the, all the elements which are processed within the supernova and during the explosion becomes a part of the interstellar medium. And so when the new set of stars are formed, they form with a material which is already enriched with a previously, uh, you know, for, which was previously formed in its supernova. So supernovae are, you know, influencing the chemical um, content in the galaxy. They're also influencing the dynamics of the, ga the interstellar gas and hence they regulate the star formation. So that is why these kind of objects, the supernovae and stellar mergers, are, are very interesting to study. So how do we study them? Obviously using telescopes, a very brief uh, on the kind of telescopes that we have in the country. So we have several one to four meter class uh, telescopes in the country. Uh, this is the observatory in Hanley that uh, uh, Sri Devi was uh, talking about. Uh, this is an observatory here in, uh, very close by in Tamil Nadu called the Vainubapu Observatory. Uh, this observatory is in Devastan, close to Nainital, which has the, the country's largest uh, 3.6 meter telescope. 
So these are all the varieties of optical near infrared telescopes that we have in the country to study these objects. In other wavelength regions, the giant meter wave telescope for the radio region, the gamma ray telescope, the MACE in Hanley, another gamma ray telescope uh, in uh, Hanley. It's an array of uh, seven telescopes called the Hagar. And India's uh, multi wavelength uh, space mission. The only mission that we have totally dedicated for uh, astronomy, this consists of uh, several instruments which will allow us to study all the way from hard X rays to the ultraviolet and uh, you know, the, the optical uh, region. And in the future, we will be having access to some of the largest facilities in the world. We are partnering with the 30 meter um, uh, telescope and building the 30 meter telescope, which uh, will come up in uh, Hawaii. So this is a telescope which has the primary uh, mirror diameter of 30 meters. And it is also unique in the sense that all this, uh, this entire uh, 30 meter telescope, uh, the primary, it consists of actually 492 uh, individual segments, which are kept aligned together to behave like a single uh, mirror. And India is contributing very significantly to the building of uh, to the build of this um, telescope. India is also a partner in the for future uh, large radio telescope arrays, uh, which is called the Square Kilometer Array, which has uh, two components. One is um, an array which will operate in the low radio frequencies, and the other which will operate in the high radio frequencies. India is an extremely active member of this project too. And we will have our own gravitational wave uh, detector. This will be built in India in a site in uh, Maharashtra. We have also proposed to have a 10 meter class um, optical infrared telescope, which will be located in Hanley. There is a proposal to have a a new ultraviolet uh, telescope and uh, an X-ray mission. So in the future, we will have some of the most you know, state-of-the-art um, telescopes and instruments made with cutting-edge uh, technology, which will be available for uh, doing uh, astronomy and you know, observing these varieties of uh, objects in the universe. So to wind up, I've just given a small glimpse of the universe. But the universe is vast and it is ever changing. And our knowledge of the universe is extremely minimal. What we know today is just the tip of the iceberg. We know a lot, but it is not everything. So we need to learn more, we need to observe more, we need to have better and better instruments to be able to probe the universe. So all this makes astronomy an extremely exciting field. And what is very interesting about astronomy is that it encompasses several areas of science and technology. You have chemistry coming in, you have physics coming in, you have biology also coming in. And you know, you have technology of various kinds all areas of engineering which are required to do astronomy. So the technological development which happens, which is required for astronomy, actually helps in other areas also. So it's a, it's a wonderful handshake between the technological development and the, the furtherment and, and, and enhancement of science, which makes this field an extremely exciting. So what Indian astronomy needs is young astronomers and young engineers with dedication to keep the Indian astronomy at the forefront. And I hope that you know several of you who have heard me today will come into this area of astronomy either as astronomers, as researchers, or as engineers coming together to build you know high precision instruments to do astronomy. Thank you.
Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, we are now open for questions, but we'll have to wait for a few minutes uh, because we are looking at the chat box, and then uh, I'll come back to you. Sure. During the time, I can tell you know. See, we spoke about paradigms of science. So the fourth paradigm on which we have named the main application of that data intensive scientific discovery is what today's whatever Anupama was showing. Because in a here you don't really go and physically observe and say such a thing exists. It's all based on the observations from here and data mining. So that is what I wanted to tell all the students because this is a real example of fourth paradigm of science. Where, like Anupama concluded, saying, you know, maths, physics, everything, computational, then AI, ML, everything comes into play. Very nice field, actually, for the current uh, generation to pursue with all the very sensors we are having to collect huge amounts of data. There's so much to do. So much and so much if somebody is interested. So this I wanted to say. Now you can go to your questions if there are any. Ma'am, in the meantime, I would like to ask if any student wants to become an astrophysicist, so where should he start? Means after his plus two, where should he uh, apply for? Okay, there are two channels um, as of today. One is that uh, you, know, you do an MSc. Um, physics is what is preferred, and uh, you know, then you can do a PhD. And PhD in astronomy. A physics background is very um, uh, important, as well as you know having a good mathematical background is also uh, important. So you take this basic science stream. The other is even with engineering. So we do have, in fact, a lot of people with engineering background who are some of the finest astronomers today. So engineers also do basic astronomy research. As well as they build, they, they come into the field of astronomy to build telescopes, to build instruments, to build software for the data analysis. And so you have both streams that can, you know, come into doing astronomy. Okay. And uh, in in your institute, uh, do, do you take in interns for um, projects, small projects, or something like that? Yes. Yes, we do take in uh, interns. Um, we generally take in uh, students who are doing their masters or engineering students who are also doing their uh, engineering both undergrad and uh, graduate level that's a master's level students yeah. for uh, projects uh, there are different types of projects you know um, that are there different schemes which are there uh, you can come as a summer project student or you can come to do projects which are part of your coursework mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so that will be a, a longer stretch, a year or a six months or six years. Or we also have another uh, thing called the visiting students, um, you know, project scheme where they come and they work for a slightly longer duration than what a summer project student would be doing. Okay. So there are several. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Seems like that we don't have any questions in our chat box. But I just want to tell you that you reminded me of my planetarium days of school, where, where when we went to uh, school, they used to take to uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium in Bangalore. And then we used to have this wonderful, you know, mouth opening our sessions in those, uh, where the screen is on the top and you're seeing like this on top and you're like, so feeling so small in this such big universe. It was so beautiful. And when you showed us that, um, uh, gamma ray event I could literally remember uh, there was this uh, scene in that planetarium where they showed how two s stars would hit each other mm -hmm. and I was in eighth standard I was like wow it that was the expression and today when I saw that you just reminded me of all those things thank you ma'am thank you for this wonderful session Sridevi ma'am do you want to add anything oh it was so nice like you know full time I heard it so, <laughs> but I know, but then, you know, it's just that hearing it all over again was really very interesting. And the way she spoke also was very Thank excellent, you. actually, for me. I, so, I hope all the 
uh, students they really could get lots of information and it was interesting to them also and I once again thank you so much anupama thank you so pavitra when you talked about the planetarium yes i just i just want to tell you that you talked about being in total or you know in the planetarium yeah you go to a dark site like hanley and when it is yeah so all you feel there is something way beyond what you ex- you know experience in a planetarium noted ma'am i shall visit that place actually you know you can see with naked eye exactly okay yeah. okay so i'll make so sure that i do that hope, uh, and uh, i should tell you having said that that we do have you know groups of students from schools visiting our observatories you know like the one in uh, kavalu or the one in kodaikanal okay. and we do encourage uh, school visits or college visits okay. so people can just go to the website indian institute of astrophysics and you can uh, you know uh, seek permission or plan uh, visits by groups of students yes we do a lot students really like that ma'am they would really like that kind of exposure yes yes i think it's very important yes ma'am so yes. if we can go to hanley we welcome there also <laughs> that is hard to go <laughs> yeah hanley we do, have, we do have children coming there school children coming there actually and yeah. college children now you know and you have to go on the days when it is dark night you know like you yeah. should check the moon position and go otherwise you can't see anything it will be like so uh, the new moon clear night for a bill the new moon day will be preferable yeah, yeah. so a clear cloud also no clear skies they should be cloud avoid monsoon period you know winter is best winter time is the best to go to kavalu kodaikanal okay okay kandle um, winter is too cold you have no chance for to go in some yes I hope all the students have noted down this piece of information and will make full use of it. In the meantime, you can check up previous sessions on paradigms of science, physics of Indian summer monsoon, artificial intelligence videos on our CSR YouTube channel. Do share the videos, like and subscribe to our channel. I once again thank Dr. Anupama ma'am for agreeing to do with us. It was an absolute honor to have with you. Thank you very much. Until next time. Goodbye take care and stay safe namaste thanks thank you bye ma